This conference will now be recorded. Great, thank you, Norval. Uh, hopefully, folks can hear me. Hear me okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but thank. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, thanks for having me, uh, Norval. It's always good to chat with uh, ASQ and, and be part of that. And I know folks on the on the line might not be uh, ASQ specific folks, but you know that's great. Uh, I'm just as a member myself of ASQ and and a past chair for ASQ Vancouver up here in Canada. Uh, it, I'm pretty excited to see the success that that the Blue Ridge uh, group has had with uh, these webinars. So that's very very positive and and great to see. So. Um, today, I'm going to give a little bit of a talk about customer satisfaction, uh, its importance, uh, and some ways to ensure that we're sort of fully using uh, our customer satisfaction and customer survey kind of activities. Um, so we'll, we'll walk through that today and, and kind of cover a few topics. All right, why are we not seeing this? There we go. So just to give you a bit of uh, idea of who this guy is virtually standing up in front of you, just so you have a sense of, of where I've been and, and what I've been involved with. Uh, so I do have a, a long title, but uh, I am the National Manager, Continuous Improvement and Customer Survey for Staples Business Advantage Canada. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with a little uh, office products company called Staples. Uh, I work up in Canada and I work for the business side of it. So I work for the business to business side, not necessarily uh, with the stores themselves. Uh, and I'm responsible for the continuous improvement activities and then the survey itself for uh, SBA Canada. I've been in the manufacturing field for 10 years before I came to um, Staples. And, and the reason I kind of bring that up is that's kind of where I had first had my first sort of formal introduction into customer surveys and getting feedback and that sort of stuff. Uh, I became the technical and quality manager there. Uh, and, and one of the responsibilities was looking at the customer uh, feedback system. So uh, it was a, a good start to it. Uh, we use the acronym there, OTIS, O-T-I-S. Uh, and we called it because it was an opportunity to improve service. So we used the uh, OTIS acronym to, to talk about our customer survey. Because we really saw it as that we, when we first started looking at it, uh, and we first started bringing in that the, the common thing was, oh, these are customer complaints. These are customer complaints. And we really wanted to get away from that and say, no, it really is an opportunity for us getting this feedback. It's it's a complaint. Yes, it's they're, they're talking about something, but it, it provides the opportunity to do something even better. So uh, and just a funny story with that that naming of that acronym. Uh, my wife and I both worked at that same organization and still to today, we still argue about who actually came up with that uh, acronym Otis. Uh, and just for the record, since she's actually not on this webcast, it was me. Uh, I've been in the distribution field for 12 years uh, with Staples. So it was interesting to go from manufacturing to distribution and go to a company where, um, you know, customer survey, uh, it is quite a big uh, activity, lots of technology being used, uh, lots of different ways to get the voice of the customer. So it was, it was an interesting switch to, to go to there. Uh, I am uh, ISO 9 and 14 trainer and auditor. Uh, so ISO 9 and, and 14 obviously have a big component of the voice of the customer. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so it really does fit in well with customer satisfaction. Uh, I'm a core health and safety auditor. I'm a certified black belt uh, from ASQ International. Uh, so used a lot of the Six Sigma black belt stuff to work on continuous improvement activities that came uh, out of and spun out of our, uh, our customer survey. Uh, past chair of the ASQ Vancouver section, which I mentioned, which is uh, a great little tie in for this. I'm an owner of a small consulting company. Uh, so I do uh, some consulting around quality, sustainability and safety. And I'm a Pisces, I'm addicted to my Xbox when I actually get an opportunity to play it, and I enjoy long walks in the park. So now you know a little bit about me. So let's talk about the impact of customer satisfaction and why it's become so important over the last little while. Uh, I think that there's you know, been a, a very big shift with the way uh, customer satisfaction is communicated, gathered, and the impact of it uh, that we've seen. There used to be the stat, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, I'm suffering from a little bit of a cold. 
there used to be a stat that said that between seven to 11 people would be told of a bad uh, service experience. So if you had a bad experience, they said on average, you know, you would tell people in sort of a seven to 12, seven to 11 people would be told. Now with social media, that is the millions. That That is, um, you know, lots of people are getting heard about it. And the other thing is, is that, you know, if you got bad service from a local store, that organization, you know, they might have the, the bad experience at that local area, but it might not affect the rest of it. Now with social media, you could have your whole organization affected globally by somebody putting something out on social media and all of a sudden everybody across the globe uh, has a voice to say, you know, what they like or dislike about your organization. So, you know, your whole organization can get Im impacted from it. So just to kind of highlight a few of those that we've seen over the last little while, you might be familiar with, uh, there was a gentleman who took a United flight and uh, they destroyed his guitar. He was a singer uh, with a small band uh, and they destroyed his guitar. And he went back and talked to them and tried to get them to fix it. And they did an extremely poor job uh, fixing it and basically said, too bad, you know, we're not we're not fixing it. Uh, that's the way that, um, that, that the cookie crumbles. Uh, he went and made a funny little song. You can look at uh, it up on YouTube. It's called United Breaks Guitars. Uh, it's currently at 16 million views. Just a, a funny song talking about the poor experience he had, you know, called out specific people that he talked to in the organization who didn't help him, uh, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, made a career out of it, written a book, goes on the talk circuit. Uh, his band is doing better. So uh, it really kind of went all the way out there and 16 million people saw that. So what was the cost to the organization for that? <clears throat> It cost uh, shareholders with the stock dropping, it cost them $180 million uh, when that video came out and people started to boycott them and not use them and talk about how poor they were and, and that sort of stuff. And if they had just replaced that guitar, they could have replaced his guitar 51,000 times uh, for the amount of money that they actually lost based on um, that experience. So, you know, we, we kind of, talk a little bit about uh, some of those issues. And one of the big ones, obviously, is the gentleman who unfortunately got dragged off of the plane uh, and had to uh, endure that. And that became a social media nightmare for them and, and really pushed about how poor their customer satisfaction is, how bad they are and this and that and that sort of thing. This actually cost them the worst. This was 1.4 billion in a stock devaluation when this happened. Uh, they said, never said how much they compensated the person, but rumors are that they compensated him $140 million uh, for the experience. And really what it would have cost them to have given him a, a free ticket or to have done something else different would have paled in comparison to what they lost in the stock market and what they had to pay him out. So they could have given him a free upgrade to first class and, and $10,000 and they still would have been ahead instead of where they were at. So, so it's a real challenge to really look at this and, but you can see the importance of it in this age uh, that we live in, because if you've ever seen that old commercial, you know, I uh, told two friends and then they told two friends and then they told two friends, uh, it's an old shampoo commercial. That's really what's happening now is that people are telling other folks and it's getting spread out and it's getting around. So it's important for us to really pay attention and, and kind of understand how we're gathering that uh, customer satisfaction. <coughs> Excuse me. So when we're looking at customer satisfaction, we're really looking at this kind of graphic of trying to understand some of the, the expectations and the gaps that are throughout um, the, the whole experience with an organization. So one of the biggest challenges is that perception versus expectations. I think that that's that's the big one that we really have to look at. And that's what your customer satisfaction can help you with. So your know, customer has a specific expectation of what your product or service is going to be like. So we, we kind of need to, to understand what that perception is. And we'll talk a bit about that. Your customers' uh, expectations and and what your product or service is producing is is something that you also have to look at. Is, is you know are we meeting their expectations? Do do we think that what we produce is actually going to meet their expectations? And then what we're producing does it meet the possible perceptions of what that customer might be looking for? So we might think, yeah, we we certainly do meet their expectations, but your customer may be looking at it and saying, no, my perception of what that product or service should be doing is different from what you're providing. 
So all of that kind of gathers up into your customer satisfaction and really gets you to have to need and understand how you can fill those gaps and do a bit of investigation and a bit of interpretation and a bit of trying to understand some of that information. And we'll, we'll talk about that because it can be challenging to get the true voice of your customer. So I like to say there's three purposes to your survey <clears throat> that we have. It's what we are doing well, what are we doing poorly, and what can we do differently? And what we can do differently is one of the things that leads to a lot of innovation, which we're going to talk a little bit about too. If part of using those customer services is not just maintaining what we're doing, fixing what we're doing. It's also looking and saying, what could we do differently? What could we innovate? What could we provide the customer that our, that our competitors aren't doing right now? And if we can do that, then we gain more customers. We embed the customers more. Uh, you know, it works really well and become leaders out, out in the marketplace and, and really responsive to what our customers are, are saying. So, you know, what we're doing well, that, that's good, but a lot of times people folk say, okay, well, we don't have to focus on those. Those are, those are fine. You know, we, we've got good scores on those. Let's, let's not worry about that. Let's worry about what we're doing poorly. But the problem you run into is, is that you need to make sure that what you're doing well continues to be doing well. Uh, you need to monitor those just as much as the ones you're doing poorly because your customers expecting those are going to be good. Those are going to happen. If it doesn't happen, it could uh, negatively reflect on your, on your uh, scores and on your organization. So what we're doing poorly, obviously, is, is the big one. You know, if you've got low scores, those are the ones that you want to look at and say, you know, what can we do better? How do we fix them? But again, they can't be at the expense of, of number one. We still have to keep those in the back of our mind. And then, like I said, use use them for innovation. Look and see what you can do differently. You know, kind of glean out the information and say, what, what are customers telling us that uh, maybe we can uh, hold on to and try something new? And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Um, one uh, with Staples where we had customers providing us feedback and one of the customers uh, or a few of the customers started saying, you know, what would be really great is I do all of the ordering for the organization. So a whole bunch of different people in the office all send me different information. They provide me different information. Uh, you know, I have to gather it all up. I got it all put to put it all together. And it would be great if we had some way to do this differently. That's that's the only thing that bugs me about dealing, you know, with your organization. And we looked at it and said, well, that's not really us. You know, that that's not much we can do with it. But somebody came back and said, well, maybe we can do something with it. We came up with a concept called group orders where we allow um, there's a central person who orders but other folks can log into the system, order their product. It goes to the central person who then reviews it and places one singular order. So then they're not getting scraps of paper and, you know, catalogs and all that sort of stuff. People can kind of do that on their own. So that's something we gleaned out of that. Uh, if you've gone to Starbucks, I'm sure everybody has, and you've got one of those little plastic stoppers that you put in your drink so it doesn't spill. Uh, that actually came out of uh, customer survey and customer feedback. A customer said it'd be great to have some way to make sure that, you know, coffee doesn't spill and I have this particular issue. And they came up with the idea of putting that, that little plastic stopper into the inside. Uh, and that came from a customer feedback uh, um, innovation. So some of the challenges that we can have with our survey, I think it's important to kind of look at and kind of see it can be sometimes challenging to get sort of honest or or good customer feedback. And I don't mean mean good in a bad way. I just kind of mean that sometimes customers will provide you feedback, uh, but it might be feedback that says, uh, you know, we're rating your web experience a one, so it's it's not very good. And the comment is your website sucks. And it's like, okay, great, but how? Like like what's bad with it? What don't you like about it? You know, so it can be challenging to say. You know, what's that feedback that we're getting back from those folks? Um, sometimes your customers are only providing feedback when they're really happy or when they're really mad. So how do you find out sort of the, the in-between customers or customers that are, are doing um, the survey and, and making sure it's being done properly? You know, they could be really mad and that could be a one-off instance and not reflective of, of their usual experience, but they've taken the time to come and do that. Or they could be extremely happy, which is great. Uh, and providing that feedback. So we, we kind of need to see, get a good mix and, and make sure we're not just getting those sort of two extremes. I know a lot of organizations now, oh, yeah, a lot of organizations now are 
providing uh, incentives to take a survey. Uh, you know, I was at Home Depot the other day and, and got the, the receipt and on the receipt it says, take our survey, win $1,000, I think it actually is $1,500 worth of gift cards, um, you know, to do that. I, I work in the customer survey field. Uh, I own that at my organization. That didn't incentivize me to even take that survey. Um, you know, so so do they work? Do, do they really drive that that kind of activity? And and most people are finding they don't. They, they they don't actually drive that information. So you have to be careful with that incentive. Sometimes people will also take the survey just to try to get that incentive. So they go in and it's like five 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 all the way down, so that they can just get to the end, put their name in, and hopefully get one of their their um, gift card so it doesn't really provide that that same incentive that uh to take that survey so uh that can be a challenge how do you get folks to to take that incentive and and do that when when even providing gift cards doesn't do it um other challenges you get is is sort of the the comments from customers where it's hard to do any activity with them you know so you'll get something like you know you'll never be perfect there's always room for improvement uh, I never give people four uh, scores of five because they could all, you know, then you would never improve. Again, that kind of speaks back to that honest or good feedback. That's great. But what's the thing you want us to fix? If if you're saying we're not perfect and, and there's room for improvement, we need to know what those things are. Uh, so that can bring your score down without really providing you the right information and the right um, feedback. So you kind of have to kind of understand and, and get a little bit of information from that. And one thing I've been seeing out in the field a lot more, and, and probably you guys might be seeing this too, is customer satisfaction sort of pushes to give perfect scores. So organizations coming back and saying, you know, I, I went to, to get my car to the dealership, got the, the dealership to do it, got an email survey from them afterwards. And it said, you know, our goal is to make sure you have an extremely satisfied experience. We get rated, <clears throat> excuse me, on the percentage of extremely satisfied scores that we get. Uh, if there's anything that that we can do to make sure that you will give us an extremely or you had an extremely satisfied experience, please let us know. I've seen that at hotels. I've seen that at car dealerships. I've seen that at different areas at restaurants. Uh, it's kind of that push to give you a perfect score. So if you're pushing the customer to rate you high or giving them an incentive to rate you high, you're not really getting true voice to the customer. So that can be can be challenging also, uh, and ha we have to be aware of that when we're doing sort of our surveys. And that can come with, with the questions also. Some of the questions we ask could be leading questions where you're leading the customer to give you a good score. And, and again, that's not providing good, honest feedback. So some keys to a, a good customer survey in my mind, uh, you need to determine your audience. It, it doesn't always, isn't always a one size fits all. Um, great example is Staples. Staples has a retail side, and we have a business to business side. The, the survey is not the same survey to both of those folks because those are two different transactional activities. Uh, so you're going to have different questions going to different audience. So, uh, you know, it can confuse the customer. You can get uh, information that's not valid. So you really want to make sure that your audience is the right. Uh, the right audience you're getting it to. And also the audience of who your survey is going to. Um, you know, in, in some instances, um, we're a great example of that. We're sort of the contract business to business side. So we may do, um, you know, a contract with the head office at Home Depot in Toronto. Uh, and then we ship to all of the Home Depots across Canada. The survey will go out to the person who ordered the, the product. So the person in Vancouver at the Home Depot in Burnaby who orders it, they get the survey, they fill out the survey, but really we created the contract with the person in, in the home office in Toronto. So they may look at the survey and say, well, uh, you know, the pricing's not good. Um, you know, uh, this isn't being done or that, that's not being done. And they don't understand, oh, you know, that was part of your contract. I can't access these products. Well, you can't access those products because it's restricted from your contract because your head office said, these are the things that we want you to buy. These are things with the best uh, savings we get, you know, whatever it might happen to be. So that can, can also sometimes skew your results. So you wanna make sure you're getting it to the right audience and getting the right information. Uh, keep it short, 
have you know one or two methods of reaching out to your customer you know have a, a, a traditional survey and maybe a phone survey at the end when they call customer care or something like that but don't have multiple ways to to get to the customer because then the customer will just feel they're getting survey fatigue every two seconds you're asking them for a survey or every two seconds you're you're, you're someone's asking can you take our survey so we want to make sure that you're you're getting it uh, and you're not overloading them so that they decide your response rate gets too low and they end up not doing it um keeping your scoring simple and appropriate that's that's another one uh you know there's always the debate you know what's the scoring um range should we do one to five should we do one to ten uh i'm more of a proponent of one to five one to five is, is an easier one for people to pick one to ten gives you more variation but that can also vary by customer so when you give folks a one to ten I may look at it and go, that was a six experience. You look at it and say that was a nine experience. Somebody else looks at it and say that was a seven experience. That was an eight experience. Well, what's the difference between a seven and an eight and a six? Um, you know, so it can be more challenging. If you do a one to five, one is usually extremely dissatisfied, two is somewhat dissatisfied, three is neutral, four is somewhat satisfied, and five is very satisfied. That's a very simple, easy way for people to kind of kind of get the middle a little higher a little lower so it can be a, a little easier i find to use the one to five versus a one to ten uh your wording can count uh if you're doing a survey do you use very dissatisfied extremely dissatisfied very satisfied extremely satisfied uh you know somewhat satisfied partially satisfied uh, you know folks kind of see different ways and, and interpret those those words differently um you know one of the things i always get i'm always very excited about office supplies sometimes you know our customers might not be that uh excited about it um so we use extremely satisfied and we do get some comments from customers saying you know what it's pens and pencils i can't be extremely excited about pens and pencils uh, very satisfied that's perfectly fine you guys do a great job very happy and do do, do an excellent uh, opportunity for it so uh, have a net promoter score uh, net promoter scores we'll talk about in a second but that's sort of the new one that we're looking at that a lot of organizations are doing and that can help you with keeping it short uh, and getting some good solid feedback uh, determine frequency and, and method you're going to deliver it so I just saw a chat uh, window pop up about uh, frequency and that sort of stuff it really depends um, but I would say the more often is better um, you know if you can get a weekly survey out to your customers that's much better this the 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 experience has happened uh, you know that's fresh in people's minds if they've had a good experience uh, you know they're 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 willing to kind of put that information in there right away that's why it's on your receipt when you get it um, because they want you to take that right away because it's about your experience as you go. Uh, if you leave it longer, it also um, can be detrimental for you to do any activity with those surveys. Okay. So if you know you you survey people in, in throughout the month and you gather your data at the end of the month, maybe it takes you another two weeks to to analyze the data and get the data out send it out to the various teams maybe it takes them another two weeks to kind of start putting some action plans together and in the meantime it's almost been two months since the customer uh, placed the or placed the survey and you guys are actually dealing with the survey so to me the frequency will will depend on your organization depend on the ability for you to you know put it out get it out to your customer um, most people say if it's transactional it should be something that's after the transaction so uh, you know, if they're they're ordering something and you get a get a uh, confirmation on the order, surveys usually in that. If they uh, place the order and it gets delivered, maybe the survey goes out after it gets delivered. Uh, if it's you know very transactional over the phone, it's usually right at the end where the customer service is saying, "Oh, do you mind uh, taking a quick survey uh, at the end to 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 rate our service?" So they they really do. It should be more quicker than than not. Uh, you want statistically valid results, so you want to make sure you've got enough responses for it to be statistically valid to be a representation of your organ of your your customer base, um, and that can work both ways. You know, not getting too little, but also not getting too much. You, you don't you know once you've statistically got enough that's valid for your your organization, you don't need to collect twenty twenty five thousand through thirty thousand responses maybe. Uh, that could be just extra work you don't need. Uh, that's not statistically making a difference. 
But if it's lower than that, uh, it can be challenging. It can be challenging to provide those results to the business because the business may also look at it and say, you know what, there just isn't enough uh, data from, from uh, that to really make actions because the response rate is so low. Uh, and you need to do some actions. You need to get after the activity. Uh, you know, something needs to be done. The customers are putting the information in there. Uh, some you, you need to do an activity with it. You know, uh, some customer relationship management uh, software that's out there. There's lots of uh, software out there that can help you uh, use that customer satisfaction, log it, attach it to your your customers' information, sales uh, activity. Sales folks can look at it. Uh, I put one there, salesforce.com is, is a good CRM system that's out there. Um, you can integrate those comments, but you need something that, that you've got some process to collect and analyze that data, some good feedback mechanisms, uh, some proven techniques you use to target improvement, making sure your data is stored so you can look at it, you can analyze trends, you can see what's happening. And a good thing with a lot of CRMs is you can you can create activity actions with them. So uh, in Salesforce, one of the things that, that you can do, we use that, um, you put the customer survey information in there, you can have uh, um, an act call to action for it, they can put their information in to say what, what occurred, uh, they can escalate it to somebody, they can get two or three people involved in, in the corrective action, uh, all that information is there if you've got uh, the ability to have good technology in there. Uh, but when I started with, with customer survey, it was Excel and you know getting manual and, and putting them in there and that works too, just more time consuming. But you need to have some system that you can keep track and, and follow your information. So the survey is obviously one of the, the main ways to get the feedback and get that information. But, you know, there's lots of other ways that you can kind of look at it, too. And you should look at it from a, a whole picture, not just what you know, you're getting out of your, your surveys. We can look at complaints, warranty cards, uh, customer surveys, your lost customer analysis. You know, if you can uh, do exit uh, interviews with your customers, your sales reps going out and saying we lost this customer because of this, this and this. Well, that's valuable information. Uh, some customers may not ever take the survey. So, you know, whatever way you can get that information would be great. And if you're going to be looking at your, your customer satisfaction, your feedback, you kind of want to maybe benchmark it and or see what your industry is like. So you may want to look at focus groups or some media research or you know, industry market research and say, you know, how are we comparing to uh, other areas out in the market. So we talked a little bit about that net promoter score and, and with customer satisfaction, that's one of the newer um, ones that are out there that we're looking at and, and seeing out in the marketplace. It's called the NPS net promoter score. It's touted as sort of the ultimate growth metric and it shows how loyal your customers are and, and how um, they're going to stay around. Um, but really, it's one question. It's uh, on a scale of zero to 10, how likely are you to recommend our product or service to a friend or colleague? And you'll see that a lot on a lot of uh, things that you buy online. Um, I find that when I buy something and I get the uh, order confirmation, a lot of times this question is right there uh, and says, you know, can you please take a minute to do our survey? Some pl places I've done this survey and that's the only question that they actually have uh, is that one because it makes it very simple, very quick, and they can get feedback from the customer right away. Uh, the score is an index ranging from negative 100 to 100 uh, to positive 100. It tells you how happy your customers are with your, your product or service. Uh, and a score about 50 or higher is considered a good solid indicator of brand loyalty and, and customer success. Uh, and obviously, if you're in the negatives, that's telling you you've got uh, some some issues to, to look at because you've got more people uh, saying they would not recommend you than would recommend you. Okay. So here's how we kind of calculate it. If we look at the zero to 10, folks in the zero to six range are called detractors. Those are folks that, that aren't actively saying that, that you're, you know, they'd want to do business with you. They may actually be going out and saying, you know, I, I've had poor experience with them. Sevens and eights are called passives. They could go either way. They're, they're sort of non-committed uh, and they could go either way. Their service is fine, but, you know, maybe something goes wrong, they'll slip into the detractor. If something really good happens, then they'll pop into the promoters. Uh, but your NPS is the percent of promoters, your nines and tens, minus the percent of detractors that you would have. Okay. So that provides you uh, a, a good information with that. 
uh, and gives you a good percentage to say, uh, you know, what is actually happening? How loyal are people? Uh, how likely are you to grow if you've got high promoters? Uh, the challenge you have a little bit with the NPS is, is again, that scoring is a bit subjective because you got that one to 10, or sorry, zero to 10. Uh, so again, you know, what I see as a seven, somebody else might see as an eight, somebody else might see as a nine, somebody else might see as a 10. Uh, so with that broader range, it can be a little more challenging. And, and somebody may put a seven and be perfectly happy with the organization, but they kind of fall into that, that passive set. Uh, as a sort of newish metric, if you're using that and you, you're you used to using another one that, that gives you a 90% satisfaction rate or you know 95% satisfaction rate, and now all of a sudden you're going to an NPS and your satisfaction with the NPS is 50, people may go, well, gee, that seems like a really low score for us. And it's technically it's not. You know, like you were saying on the slide before, you know, 50 or plus is actually really good from an organizational standpoint. Uh, the other thing that, that you could find, especially if you're using it in a business setting, is the, the question being, you know, would you recommend this service to a uh, friend or colleague? Some folks may look at that and say, well, you know, this is a business setting. My friends don't or can't use this product or service, so I'm just going to rate you a zero because they can't use it. And, and so you have to watch that question and kind of make sure you, you see any follow up. Uh, comments to that to kind of understand and those you may have to take out as outliers and say you, you know they're just not seeing it the way that we'd like it to, to, to be seen uh, and it might be a challenge for them it could be challenging to find a benchmark for your industry because it is a little bit new and it does change uh, and not every industry is kind of profiled with an MPS it can be challenging to say okay what what should our industry be at uh, and if you use that as the only mechanism or the only uh, service attribute you may find that other service attributes aren't being indicated because you're only using that one and, and saying, you know, this is this is what our customers are coming back with. So the MPS should be a component, but it shouldn't be the exclusive thing that you use because there are gonna be other service components that uh, customers may, may like or dislike um, that affects their overall score. So here's just some examples uh, of some MPS leaders in North America. Uh, so this was from 2016, and you can see uh, a few of the folks in there, you know, 70, 69, 66, uh, the highest is at 80. Um, so, you know, those are high, those are higher, but uh, they're still not what you would, would see OG, you know, 95% uh, satisfaction rate. Well, these are still exceptional uh, net promoter scores out in the market. Uh, so like we talked about, you know, you need to determine the measures your organization is going to use once you get those um, results back. Are you using only the fives extremely satisfied? Are you combining your fours and fives uh, to be an overall satisfaction uh, rate? So, you know, that can be different because, again, you know, customers may not rate you super high because they're they're fine with it and somewhat satisfied as a four is perfectly fine. So you may combine those two. Uh, to have a more overall satisfaction score. Uh, you need to determine how you're going to communicate those results. You know, who's it going out to? Are you going to all of the associates in your organization? Do they, they get an update? Is it just going to your sales team? Is it just going to your executive team? Uh, where and who and how is that information getting out to uh, everybody? Create an expectation of the actions from those those results. You know, putting them out there is one thing, but but you need to to set an expectation that that you know they should be going up. Or here's our goal. Or you know, uh, condition improvement activities need to be done to make sure we hit these numbers. Uh, definitely investigate the comments. The comments are are harder to look at uh, just because um, you, you know you can't categorize them as easily as numbers. Uh, but you're definitely going to get more information and more. Uh, insight into your organization from really looking at those comments and really understanding those comments. Uh, and then determine those benchmarking activities. How are you going to benchmark? Are you going to, you know, department to department, locations to locations against your competitors, against the best in class? Uh, you know, are you going to say we want to uh, be as good as Costco, so our NPS needs to be at 78? Is that a fair assessment? If it is, then maybe that's sort of your benchmarking activity that you want to use and, and what you want to get to. Um, but you need to have those activities, you need to have those goals, and need to have those um, areas where you want to be in. And part of looking at, 
all of this and interpreting your results falls into something that I like to look at, which is called the Kano model, which some folks may be familiar with. Um, part of the reason why uh, this webinar kind of came about was because I I'd written a little bit of an article in the um, Quality Progress magazine about the Kano model because I, I think it's it's a really valuable way to kind of look at your organization. So the Kano model really says there's a relationship between three types of quality or service characteristics. There's what we call the must be or present or most basic uh, activities that an organization needs to have and that allows a company to get into the market. They have to have these particular things to even be considered a competitor out in the marketplace. A consumer is looking at it and saying, if you don't have these things, you can't be in this particular industry. These are the basics that you have to have. Um, then there's the what we call the performance characteristics and these are what allow a company to sustain and remain competitive so this is the kind of thing that says you know how are you doing against your competitors do your your customers see that you're you're at the top and you're doing really well compared to your competitors or are you doing at the lower end you you've got the things that that separate you from your competitors but you don't do it as well as your competitors and then the, the main thing that we really want to try to get to as a business is find out what we call those delighters. Those are things that allow a company to excel and be world class. And those are things that let you get that competitive edge out of the marketplace. They are the most challenging thing to find. They are the ones that you have to look at and say, you know, uh, you have to kind of forecast or, or kind of think through it and say, you know, what's the customer saying? Is this something that we could take and we could do something different with? Just like we were talking about with the, the coffee cup top and the, um, the group orders, you know, those were delighters that that weren't performance things. We we weren't really doing that. Uh, competitors weren't doing that, but it was something our customers were looking for, and all of a sudden went, hey, we we could do something with that that sets us apart out in the marketplace, and it became a delighter. So those are the things that we want to look at, and, and here's a great little graph that just kind of walks walks through that information uh, about how this is all set up. So we've got our basics which falls here. So we've got a, a matrix here, an X. Quality of execution is this line. So poor execution here, high execution uh, on the right side. Customer satisfaction access here. So high customer satisfaction at the top, low customer satisfaction at the bottom. So we start with the basic, which is the, the red line. And basically the basic is, is those are the assumed or expected features that that you have to have for, for us to even, you know, for customers to even uh, use your service. Okay? And it's not doing those really well aren't going to get the customer to be more satisfied because they kind of look at it and they say, of course, so what? Like you have that, so does everybody else. You have to have that to be in the marketplace. So, you know, providing something more than that uh, or saying, oh, this is a feature, they would say, no, this is this is what I expect. Uh, you know, I have to have that or or I wouldn't even be here. But if you don't have it or you do it uh, very poorly, uh, that basic feature, then people are going to say, oh, no, this is this is no good. This is very bad. And, and they're going to be really upset and, and have a poor customer satisfaction experience and let you know that. Then you get into the performance or the standard features, which is the green line there. And those are ones that can improve your customer satisfaction because those are ones that as you do it better, uh, if you're better than your competitors, uh, they're going to be happy with that. They're going to say, you know what, these are things I expect that are a little bit more than the basic feature and how well you do them is going to make me probably be more inclined to work with you than more with your competitor. And then the delight ones are the blue line. Uh, and that is... Um, doesn't it starts at sort of a neutral kind of customer satisfaction because those delighters are things that people didn't expect so they can't have a negative experience to it because they they are delighted they're like oh this is really neat I, I didn't think that this was something that I would expect um, but if you do it better or you do it to more of a customer's uh, expectations you're gonna get a higher satisfaction so the more delighted they are the higher satisfaction they're gonna get um, so those are the ones we really want to look at because those are the ones that are going to set us uh, uh, out in the marketplace and, and make us really different from our competitors, get us that leg up. So a great example of that is this hotel example that I have here. So when we go to a hotel, you know, the basic needs that we would expect a hotel to have and we would never go to the hotel if they don't have it is maybe, you know, non-smoking rooms, uh, having a king bed uh, available, uh, clean bathrooms. Um, you know, maybe uh, having toiletries uh, available for you, um, 
you know, uh, an ironing board and an iron. Those are basic needs. When you go to a hotel, you expect those things to be there. So, you know, having a better iron or a better ironing board probably isn't going to make you go, oh, that's so much greater than, than something else. You know, having a different king bed uh, is probably not going to going to going to have you go. Oh, this is so much more exciting. A king bed is a king bed. What you get though is if you went in there and the bathroom was unclean, that would create a high level of dissatisfaction. You'd probably rate them a one because you would say, you know what, a basic expectation of me going into a hotel is to have a clean bathroom. This is not clean. This is the most basic requirement. Uh, I'm never going to stay here again. And then your performance ones, when you get into that, those are the ones that, again, set you off, uh, out in the marketplace and, and have things a little bit different. So most places have a free breakfast uh, that you go to to a hotel, but the level of that free breakfast is going to kind of say how well you are satisfied or dissatisfied and how dysfunctional that service is. So if I go to a hotel and I go down for the free breakfast and the free breakfast is, uh, you know, coffee and a muffin. And then I go to another hotel and that hotel has a breakfast bar, has a guy making omelets, you've got waffles, you've got oatmeal, you've got you know nine different types of toast and all that sort of stuff. That's going to move me higher up on that performance scale. I'm going to say, wow, they really did a good job with that. They executed really well. My satisfaction is higher. I'm going to stay at this hotel because for the same price, I'm getting a better breakfast and I'm getting a better uh, situation there. So to me, that's that's what's really good. And then you get into the exciters where people, uh, where, ho where a hotel might welcome you by name or they might give you a whole bunch of different choices of pillows because you like a softer or harder pillow or whatever it might happen to be. Maybe there's some personalized amenities that, that are for you. Uh, maybe there's a personalized concierge that will help you out. Those are things you don't expect, but when you get them and you go, oh, that's, that's all part of my experience, oh, that's great. And you get more excited and more satisfied by it. Uh, and you can say, even though you might not execute it very well, maybe you only have two choices of pillows. People would still go, oh, in no other hotel has two choices of pillows. That's really great. The challenge you have is, is you get into situations where your exciter becomes a performance expectation, which will eventually become a basic need. So you need to kind of exploit those exciters that you see right away because eventually your comp competition will start doing that. It will become a performance activity and then eventually it will become a basic need. Uh, so, you know, I talked about the free breakfast. Uh, you know, that used to be an exciter where you, you never really expected breakfast to be there. Uh, you went to some hotels, they had a free breakfast bar. You were like, oh, that's awesome. Then it became an expectation. It became a performance thing where more hotels were doing it saying, hey, we're losing to these other hotels. Maybe we need to make sure we get uh, and have a free breakfast. That became a performance, so let's get a better free breakfast than these guys. And now it's almost become a basic need where most people are looking at hotels and saying, you know, why do you not have a, a breakfast one? That's the just the basic thing a hotel should have. So you can see kind of how that mix happens. And as you get that information from your customers, that's where you can start to glean some of these activities and kind of say, you know, what might be some of those exciters? What are we doing poorly compared to our competitors? And what might be a basic need that we're not fulfilling by, by what our customers are telling us? You know, if our, our website is not good and, and, and an active website, that's a basic need. They, they want a website that works, that does particular activities. It's no longer a performance activity. Uh, and just a quick little uh, thing that I found when I recently went traveling for business that was a great exciter was I stayed at Homewood Suites in Mississauga Law, uh, bought the the reserved the the online when I was at the airport I got a, a email from them saying you know thanks for signing up do you want to use our uh, app service and I'm like sure why not so I, I loaded up their app and uh, then they said oh with your app your app will let you self check in yeah. self check out uh, and is also the key to your hotel room so when I went to Mississauga not that I didn't want to talk to people, but I didn't talk to the front person at the reception one time in my whole stay. Logged in, logged in when I when I was in the taxi to say that I was I was there, went to my hotel room, the virtual key came up, and as I walked through the hotel to go to my room, um, the business center lock would come up and say, you know, the business center is here. Then I went by the pool and it said pool uh, key. Then I went by the gym, gym key. And then I went to my room and it said your room key. I hit the tab, swiped my phone over the door and it unlocked it. 
uh, and I was ready to go. So to me, that was a, an exciter. I thought that was really well done. They did a really good job with it. Uh, I had high satisfaction. The app worked perfectly. The locking worked perfectly. I didn't lose anything. Uh, and now, though, it's starting to kind of look to me that it might be switching to a performance because I start looking at other hotels and I'm saying, oh, do they have the same thing? Because if they don't, I might just stay in, in these particular hotels. So it's an interesting kind of uh, a, a one to look at with that. So, so like we said, the basics are not going to provide you a competitive advantage, but lack of them is going to lose you customers. So you need to, to do those basics still well. And performance is, is going to be judged on how well you execute. And your competitors have those same things. So if you can execute them better than your competitor, uh, your customer is going to be more satisfied. And your delighters are those gold mines. The delighters are the performance attributes. Uh, or sorry, the delighters are things that, that people are going to get excited about, set you apart in the marketplace, but just be aware that eventually those delighters will become performance attributes, which will then become basic attributes in the marketplace. I just wanted to quickly talk about, uh, we talked about responsiveness to uh, surveys. I just wanted to walk you through kind of how Staples kind of looks at their survey and what we do. So we get our customers taking the survey if they score us a four or less uh, and leave comments, it initiates what we call a hot comments process, which is on the left. The comments are detailed to me in real time. So as soon as you press enter on my computer, it pops up and says a survey has been taken. I can read through those details. I forward them to the sales or the customer care for follow up. They're going to try to resolve that issue with the customer. So they'll call up the customer and say, Mr. Customer, you took the survey and you, know, you left this comment. You know, can we do something to help uh, help you next time with this particular issue? That's worked really great because a lot of times the first thing a customer says when they get that call is you guys actually read these things because most people think a survey gets into a black hole and nothing ever gets done or nothing ever gets, ever gets done with it. So um, they will res try to resolve the issue. They'll log it into our CRM Salesforce. We get monthly results, which are analyzed by me and distributed to the various teams. And then on a weekly basis, we also push out uh, our comments to uh, Salesforce so that they can get loaded in so that we have some of that history um, for when we're doing service activities with our customers. Uh, so that's worked really well for us. It does take a lot of technology, takes a bit of time, uh, but we've gotten seen some real good positive feedback by being very responsive to the customer. Speaking of responsiveness, if you'd like to uh, be able to look at a great book on uh, customer leadership and customer experience, there's a book called The New Gold Standard about the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Uh, they have five leadership principles that they talk about through the whole book. So defining and refining your, your customer experience, empowering your employees through trusting them, realizing it's not about you, it's about what you can do for your customers. It's about delivering that wow or those delighters. And then it's providing that lasting footprint so people uh, are excited and they they have that and they say, you know what, I'm going back here next time because it left such a lasting imprint on me, uh, that customer experience. So just in conclusion, uh, reduction of uh, operational value in assessing your customer satisfaction, we're going to reduce or eliminate conflicting encounters between customers and employees. We're going to see more uh, where we're trying to solve those problems. Employees aren't going to have to uh, try to find those solutions. We're, we're going to be looking at them through our surveys. We're going to reduce costs because we're going to be looking back. We're not going to be losing those customers. We might be, you know, helping with returns. Our reputation is going to be better. You know, any customer survey or sorry, any customer system out now that's responsive to customers, especially in the social media realm, I find people are very uh, excited by that. Uh, it's going to help growth, improve morale for your employees and, you know, customers uh, that are happy to deal with you mean uh, happy employees. It's going to lead to innovation and you're going to get much more uh, than all of that. There's so much more that you can get out of your customer satisfaction that's going to enhance your, your organization. And that is it for me. Um, so I thank you for your time. I, I hope this uh, provided you some insight into customer satisfaction. Uh, and I'm certainly open to uh, any comments or questions. Thank you, David. Uh, we do have some time available for questions here. Uh, at the end, we have a little better than five minutes. Uh, so if you do have questions for David, please use the chat box. Uh, he's also left his uh, email address there too on the screen. So uh, if you think of a question later as, that you want to ask him, uh, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer it uh, if you email it to him. Is, is that correct? 
David? Yes, for sure. Yep. Yeah. Feel free to touch base with me on LinkedIn or, or, or send me an email. I'd be more than happy. Uh, somebody put on, what would you consider a statistically valid response rate? Uh, it's hard to say um, because it's going to depend on how many customers you have, how often you're pulling the information. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult to say, but um, I can take, take a look at it uh, and see what I can come up with and, and maybe provide you some information uh, on what might be appropriate uh if there is one yeah. uh so yeah we had two of those someone else had a, an experience or thoughts in surveying government service customers um we have done that we do that a lot of uh customers at, at staples business advantage are our customer uh one so we we do get feedback we don't have an issue the thing i find with customers uh in the government service agent area is that uh you're best not to provide uh an incentive for them to take the survey um most government places can't accept a reward uh they can't be sort of feel like they're they're somewhat being influenced or anything like that to, for a supplier so you're better to put the survey out but not have any kind of uh you know take our survey and get a, a gift card or you know thing like that yeah uh david i'm getting a couple of uh, private chats asking if your powerpoint uh will be available um as part of the uh follow-up i uh, i can make it available for sure yeah okay thank you yeah i don't know um, if it's easier for them to contact me or it's easier for me to just give you a copy and yeah i'm happy to share it with folks uh as part of our follow-up because what i'll do is um i'll have a recording uh a link to the recording of, of today's talk as well as a link to uh, the survey, which we will uh, find out how things went, and then uh, I can include um, a copy of the PowerPoint with that. Sure. Okay. Now, I don't know if you noticed, there was a question very early on uh, regarding fraudulent and malicious feedback and how you would segregate and contain those effects. Did you happen to see that question earlier? Uh, yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, it, you know, the, the easiest way I kind of find is if, well, not the easiest way, but, but one way that you can, can deal with, uh, with that is the survey going out. If you're sending the survey out to anybody and everybody, yes, there's a good chance you're going to have people coming in and, and just hitting one, 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 or, or putting, you know, bad feedback and that sort of stuff. So if there's some way, if it's your business, if you can have some way for them to initiate that by, uh, going through their order number or the uh, survey goes specifically to the person that order that did the order uh, or the the purchaser or something like that that's the easiest way to kind of get around that but if you've got a general generic survey that goes out it's very challenging to do that uh, what I would say is to kind of look at it and analyze the trends and see if you're seeing you know weird things pop up or weird comments or you know a, a poor layer of scores that's not reflective in your business because your business is still doing well and your but your score is low um you know there may be some kind of weird disconnect there but um yeah it, the only way is to, to make it so it's to me is more specific to the, the customer so really only that one customer can do that um you know, uh, having them have to enter their their pass uh, their their last invoice number or something along those lines could make it so that it's easier for you to know that yes, this is a specific customer. Hope that helps. Looks like you've got a few questions here. There's one from Griselda. I don't know if you see that one. Uh, what is the average response rate? Um, I'm wonder, I, I don't think that's something I can't say. Um, last year we had, we, we, we averaged, no, sorry. Last year we had 20,000 responses for our survey. So that's over 12 months. Uh, you do have one so question that, here. That's that like says, 16, 1,600, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, we do have one question here. It says, how can we determine a representative sample size? Yeah, and I talked a little bit about that earlier, and, and it's something that I'll, I'll have to kind of get back to you on. It, it, it depends on your organization, depends on your business, depends on how many responses you can get. 
Um, yeah, there's lot, there's lots of different factors that are out there um, that are going to be able to do that. So if I, if I got some further insight on that, I'll pass it on to you, Norval, and, and you can always uh, kind of tag that on. Okay. Uh, there's another question here about any experience or, or thoughts on surveying government service customers. Yeah, I answered that one just uh, a bit back to saying, yeah, you can do that. We do that all the time. Uh, the only thing to do is not to have the, um, uh, usually you don't have an incentive to take the survey with government uh, employees. As long as you're surveying them, there's nothing wrong with that. I don't think there's any anything in, in particular to that, but a lot of government employees can accept uh, those kind of things, um, you know, uh, because it may unfairly side with a supplier or something like that. So you're better to do the survey, but just not put any kind of incentive attached to the survey. But uh, it shouldn't be an issue. We, we like I said, we do that all the time up here in Canada. Yep. Uh, let's see. I'm seeing another question further down. Uh, do customer requirements need to be fulfilled all the time to ensure customer satisfaction? Um, I don't know. That's that's an interesting question. Um, hmm. Do they have to be fulfilled all the time? I I don't think so. I think they have to be fulfilled most of the time. I think you've got to do a good job of kind of satisfying most customers, and and also you need to decide what is acceptable for your organization. Um, you know, you may say that, and for your customers. Your know, customers may say that, you know what, they're happy with an 80% or a 90% satisfaction. Do you need to get to 99? Do you want to spend the money, the time, and the effort? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. It, it depends. It can depend on your customer, how um, information, what, what they're providing to you. Um, it, it's going to depend. Uh, but I would say, you know, everybody always has a, a particular goal. It's not always 100%. Your goal is to satisfy the customer meet the requirements and make sure that they feel, yes, we've, we've done the right job. But there are going to be a portion of customers you may never satisfy and a portion of customers that will say, you know, you'll never get a five from me because there's always room for improvement. So, um, you know, trying to hit that 100% can be challenging. I've got to hop off because it's 10 o'clock, but uh, if there are others, uh, Norval, definitely feel free to, to forward them on to me, and I, I don't have any issue um, uh, responding to those. Or the person can certainly email me directly with their question, and I can answer it by email for sure. But uh, unfortunately, I do have to hop off because it's 10 o'clock on my time. All right. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, appreciate your time and willingness to present for us today. Yeah, no problem at all, and uh, thank you very much for everybody, and I uh, hope you all have a uh, great afternoon. Thanks. I was just getting ready to say the same thing. Great uh, <laughs> 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 thank you. Yeah, we do. Uh, but anyway, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar, which will be Tuesday, March 5th. Uh, small talk, big impact. Uh, until then, this is Norval Johnston, uh, hoping uh, that everybody has a great rest of the day. Thanks again. Bye now. <laughs>